Stay hungry, stay foolish. So now on the Innovation Show, we welcome senior pastor at North Coast Church, author of Innovation's Dirty Little Secret, Why Serial Innovators Succeed Where Others Fail, Larry Osborne. Larry, welcome to the show. Well, thank you. It's good to be with you. I love this book because you innovated in your church, and then you got asked by so many business leaders to bring those lessons into their business worlds. What I what I found out uh, was that uh, an organization is an organization is an organization, and uh, the principles that helped us start from a handful of people to a, a large church, so called Giga Church, were really the same principles that business leaders were facing as their organization was changing and morphing, uh, trying to figure out how to innovate or or walk through significant change. One of the things you talk about, which is really an unsung thing, is that. In innovation, most innovations fail. And I love the way you do this. You build this book into why they fail. And also, you don't just do a Nostradamus on it here and give the bad news. You're actually giving solutions here. So it'd be great to get an understanding of the book from you. The reason I wrote the book is that uh, innovation gets lots of press, but we only hear from those who are successful. So uh, maybe somebody maxes out their credit card to start a business and they borrow a bunch of money from their in-laws. And then next thing you know, they're one of the larger businesses in their country. And uh, they're on a stage telling everybody about taking risk and their innovation. But nobody's telling the story of the hundreds of people who maxed out their credit card, borrowed money from relatives they can no longer uh, face and, uh, and went under. Because the truth of the matter is, if you don't study innovation just as theory, but you're in the middle of it, that you have way more failures than you have successes. And the key to being a serial innovator is to limit the damage those failures have, because the dirty little secret of innovation is that most innovations fail. We basically would prefer to live in a world that that always has a happy ending. And like many areas, from retirement to death to health issues, we just bury our head in the sand and and hope the bad news won't come. And, and because of that, there's a lot of people that have been uh, deeply hurt along the way because they thought the bigger the dream and the riskier the attempt, uh, the greater the success that they would be guaranteed. And it's just not true. That's not how it, how it works. Human nature doesn't like to think about the negative. Earlier on in the book, you give different examples of the different types of innovators. And you talk about this serial innovator and that it's not about failing, avoiding failure. It's about failing forward. Yeah, the serial innovator, again, because of Innovation's Dirty Little Secret, has lots of failures uh, behind them. But they've uh, found the secret of experimenting with things and using the language of experimentation uh, rather than having initiatives and using the uh, language of of change. And what happens is if you're a leader with a failed uh, initiative, you're a failed leader. But if you are a scientist with a failed experiment, you're a brilliant scientist. <laughs> so uh, much of it has to do with the wording and, and making sure that we've uh, got these exit strategies and things that we're going to need uh, lined up in mind. I think of Jim Collins. He's famous for his great books on leadership. But uh, people will read about uh, BHAGs, Big Hairy Audacious Goals, and they will come up with BHAGs, Big Hairy Audacious Goals, and think that – that will lead them into the future. And I always hate to tell them the real truth is these great companies had BHAGs, but the reason they were great was not that they had a big, hairy, audacious goal. It's that they had the skill set to follow through on that big, hairy, audacious goal. Uh, a BHAG by itself will do nothing but get you in trouble if you don't have the horsepower to uh, make it a reality. The great leaders will also recognize innovators within their companies. What are the traits of innovators within an organization? Well, one of the things you'll find when you're looking in the mirror to decide whether or not you really have a gift of being a serial innovator or those on your team do is, first of all, you're going to find a history of some innovations. They might not be massive and world-changing, but they're genuine innovations, different ways of doing things that actually worked on, in life, not just on paper. But I find uh, there are uh, 
three traits that are incredibly common among serial innovators is, uh, and, and, and one of those is they have this uh, ability to mentally model things uh, in their head. And so uh, when they're working with an idea, it seems like they just had this big leap, but they really didn't have a big leap. Uh, what they had was uh, a, a quick mental model of outcomes. Uh, kind of like some chess players can see two or three moves ahead and others can barely see the move they're making. Uh, and that's that's a gift. And because of that, they tend to trust their mental model. So to outsiders, it looks like a crazy leap. But to them, it's really not a crazy uh, leap. Third thing that I find uh, in them is that they are really good with mid-course corrections. They live in the real world, not the idealistic world. They don't have a five-year plan. They have a five-year direction. I love what you say as well, that the lesson that we can learn from them is to plan and pencil. Right, very much. Because if you look back on innovation's history, they all take on a life of their own. They're never what the innovator or major change agent thought. That life has a way of throwing a curve at us. Uh, One of my favorite stories is the inventor of Novocaine. He was trying to uh, invent something that could be used in general surgery, and it wasn't strong enough. But that was his mindset. So he spent the rest of his life doing lawsuits and trying to keep dentists from using his invention. It's, are you mm-hmm. kidding me? Uh, you've got great invention, but it, when it took on a life different than his plan, he didn't know how to write it out. Uh, instead, he tried to pull it back to everything he thought. Um, he had in the beginning. And I see that over and over in true innovation. It answers not only the question you're trying to answer, uh, but it answers a series of other questions that lead in different directions. Yeah. And as you say in the book, you can use the crowd. So you're not so much an advocate of crowd sourcing for ideas, but the crowd will validate ideas. Yes. Innovation and true creativity almost always flow out of one to three people. Hardly ever does it uh, flow out of a larger group, but great critiques flow out of that larger group. And uh, when an innovator truly plans in pencil and is good with mid-course corrections, then the crowd outside can be a wonderful help. But you don't want to use them on the front end because then you get something that's just a mashup of uh, everybody else's idea and there's no edge to it. And Larry, so once we've identified as a leader in an organization, you've identified your innovators or your potential innovators, how do you support them? Well, one of the things you need to do is give them freedom, freedom to fail. One of the things that happens is as a larger um, a company or organization gets, or the more uh, financial resources it has, I call that a pass to protect, the more it becomes afraid of little failures. The problem is the more you become risk adverse, you become success adverse. So the job of a leader is to make sure that people can fail and then to make sure those failures aren't fatal. How do you help design the playground in which they're going to experiment with these things in such a way that if it fails, it's really no big deal? Uh, And I, I like to describe it this way. I never launch out on any new idea until I packed a parachute because and. I like to know at what altitude I'm going to pull that parachute. Nice. Because if I haven't packed a parachute, when it begins to go down, I'm going to put good money after bad, and I'm going to keep hanging on too long. And what I find is the best innovators, again, have this series of failures behind them, but none of them were fatal because they knew how to use the language of experimentation, and they knew when and where it was time to bail out that that great idea in the boardroom was not so great once it was released in the uh, wild. Yeah, and this is something I really learned from you in reading this book because I worked as head of innovation and I worked as that kind of change maker within organizations, but I was always overselling the idea. So because you're excited about it, you're selling it and you're, you're, trying, to, you're trying to garner support for it. But I loved what you said in the book. The language you use around it is key. So if you talk even in language of experimentation, it doesn't frighten people. It doesn't challenge the status quo, but also it gives you an exit strategy. As you say, it gives you a parachute. When we oversell, what we're trying to do is get this thing called buy-in that most of us have been told is essential. And when it comes to innovation and significant change, buy-in is impossible to get. Everybody who's ever seen an innovation adoption curve knows that over 50% of people are later adopters. 
So they won't like an idea until everybody else is for it. So by definition that has been researched by all kinds of PhD studies, uh, buy-in is impossible to get. So I always tell people what you want to get is uh, you want to get permission. Uh, let me try something. And I can get permission to try things pretty easily. Most people like to stand around and watch a train wreck. They just don't want to be in the train wreck. So <laughs> as a sense of, well, how about let we try this? Uh, why don't we do it for three months or a small little trial here, a defined trial? And in the back of my mind, um, some of our larger innovations over the year, uh, I had mentally modeled them. I knew they would work. But I use the language of experimentation so that people didn't sabotage it or tell me no. And sure enough, when it works, they all jump on a board like it's their idea, which is like, okay, I still got to where I wanted to go. Yeah, because you've used that language of experimentation, you're over delivering all the time. Yeah, you, you're over deliver and uh, you haven't lost credibility if you find out you, you were wrong. Uh, and sometimes it's not you were wrong about the idea, you were wrong about the timing. Da Vinci had a great concept of flight, but he didn't have the power source behind it. You can be spot on with, hey, this will work, or this is a great idea. But great ideas not only have a, a reality of what should be done, but they they have a, a perfect connection of when it should be done. That leads us to exit strategy questions that you should ask as a leader to almost support that innovator as well, or as an innovator, those exit strategy questions you should ask yourself. It'd be great to get to touch on a few of those. Sure. One of the key things is how we communicate. Uh, as we were talking about just a moment ago, we all tend to oversell because we, we think that gets everybody lined up to be supportive. But I always like to ask, how can we communicate this in a way that provides maximum flexibility for mid-course corrections? Because we're going to need mid-course corrections. And so uh, I'll, I'll like to think through the wording. Uh, I like to think through the platform in which we're selling something. The, the more that people know, hey, we're going to try this and we're going to tweak it along the way, uh, the more they will not panic when it's time to tweak it along the way. They'll go, oh, okay, I knew that was going to happen. I fool around a little with real estate. A couple of my friends are developers, and there's a saying in real estate that if you chase a deal hard enough, you'll catch it. What that means is uh, a deal begins to go sideways, but you've, you've put money into uh, some legal fees on the front end, for instance, or you've done uh, some stuff on what we call entitlement to make sure you're entitled to build what you want to build on that piece of property. After a while, if you haven't planned ahead of when you're going to pull the parachute, you'll keep hitting, putting good money after bad, and uh, you'll chase it strong enough that you actually catch it only to rue the day because it'll bring you down. So I like to ask questions about, okay, it might go slower than we thought, but what is the point at which it's so slow we need to bail out? What are some of the benchmarks that will tell us, okay, this is working enough that we're not losing ground financially, energy, or focus, so we'll keep plugging along? Because we all know that sometimes some of the greatest innovations don't catch on right away. Uh, they plug along and then they explode. But I need to know ahead of time when I'm going to pull the plug, because if I don't, uh, I probably won't pull it until it's too late. And you talk about as well that valued thing as a leader of credibility as well. And, and so you don't become this kind of haphazard leader that just goes after innovation to innovation, keep changing the course of the ship, and everybody on the ship is confused. Yeah. And after a while, I think there are people who are always changing direction. And then everybody just rolls their eyes and acts like they're going along with you, but they're just waiting for the next change. Uh, so nobody's grabbing an oar and rowing in the same direction. They're just pretending they are, uh, waiting for that leader to change again. But if, again, the language of experimentation has been used, and people are glad to help experiment, but they just get really tired of brand new initiatives are going to change the world, only to know another one's going to come along six months later. Yeah, and as, as you say in the book, you know you've lost the changing room when they're having bets on your next greatest harebrained <laughs> idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's been uh, plenty of uh, television shows, plays, and little books, and even cartoons uh, about the culture in uh, offices and organizations where that's exactly what happens. There's ah, uh, there'll be another one tomorrow. Yeah. So once you've identified right, and you've asked these exit strategy questions, you've set out some hypotheses of when I'll pull the plug. And as you said, you'll have your parachute ready to go. You know at what altitude you're going to pull the the cord. 
Next, you call this out, and this is so true, and this is where most innovation fails, is the culture, the corporate culture, is often the most important thing to carry an innovation through to success. Yeah, and, um, you know, you cannot destroy the past while you're trying to create the future. One of the things that often is forgotten is that every organization, after a little while, has a corporate culture. And if the innovation is outside of that culture, then it probably has to be done outside of the organization or at least at the fringe. Uh, Because at the end of the day, uh, culture is going to eat uh, policy for lunch. The way we do things around here always has far more power than the way we say we're going to start doing things around here. So you've got to figure a way to overcome that history. I like to describe it this way. Uh, When a change happens, people go, oh, that's not the way we do it. And then you do it the second year, they kind of roll their eyes. And by the third year, they go, well, this is how we've always done it. So often you change culture by simply changing behavior and being patient enough to realize the change behavior will eventually become the new culture. From a leader perspective, taking your culture into account, how can you call this chapter, how can you ignite innovation within an organization? Well, I like to ask myself, what is frustrating me most? Uh, When you look back, many of the best and and most significant uh, innovations and changes even, because innovation or change are twins separated at birth, um, the most significant ones came out of somebody who was frustrated with the status quo. Why why are we doing it this way? Uh, and uh, instead of simply pursuing innovation, uh, just for innovation's sake, it's a question of what is frustrating me? I bet it's frustrating a whole lot of other people. Uh, and then the second question is what's broken most? Uh, because there are, in most organizations, uh, things that are just flat out broken. Uh, we keep doing this thing over and over and over again, and it is flat out not working. Uh, And so I like to look at frustration and brokenness within an organization and say, these are possibly the places where innovation will make the the greatest impact. Uh, Things like just asking simple questions like, what drives me crazy? (laughs) Uh, To get real practical with this, Uh, what are we doing that makes absolutely no sense, but we keep doing it? Um, What processes and programs seem to take lots of work, but they don't bear any fruit? Um, what traditions are we putting up with simply because it's always been done that way? Those kind of questions, uh, once you get them out in front of everybody, then you can begin to tackle them. Yeah. And from experience as well, right? Without you as the leader, without you, and as you say, you're like the, the linebacker taking out the opposition for me to be able to run a clear path to get a touchdown. Mm-hmm. And without that in an organization, you really don't really stand much of a chance because you can be coming along with the greatest idea ever for your organization. You can be coming across with, you know, I, I picture that image you, you see often on the internet of cavemen with square wheels trying to bring a, a cart up a, a, a hill and another guy coming along with a round wheel going, why don't you try this? And they're saying, we're too busy. And you give the example of the QWERTY keyboard. And that, for me, just totally nailed the way the world can get, you know, apart from an organization, the world can get stuck in the way this is the way it's done. Don't try and bring me an innovation. I don't have time for that. Yeah. And and I think a good leader when it comes to innovation will realize, again, that's the timing issue with innovation, that this is better but better is not always better in everybody else's mind. And, you know, for those that are listening, the QWERTY keyboard was invented to slow down the speed with which we type uh, because uh, the mechanical keyboards were getting stuck. Uh, and the Dvorak keyboard and some others are much faster, but nobody feels the pain of the QWERTY keyboard enough to make the change. So as, as, a, as a leader in the real world, not a theorist, I don't want to waste my time on uh, getting the Dvorak keyboard or inventing another version when nobody is feeling the pain of the current keyboard that we use on our computers. And and again, that's where innovation for innovation's sake can lead us astray. It has to fix a real problem in the real world, and people have to identify it as a problem. Otherwise, it's just a great idea. 
Yeah. And, and the way you define it is nicely put as well, where, and I hadn't th- heard this before, you talk about artistic innovators versus organizational innovators. Right. Yeah, I, I find that what a business needs is, is a special kind of creativity. And it's a creativity that gets excited about limitations rather than frustrated by them. Uh, in the artistic world, uh, everything you want to do is has to be fresh. It needs to push the envelope. And it's all about having no boundaries. In fact, that's the story behind some of the art that critics, if you're not in the art field, critics will praise sometime. And the rest of us look at it and go, what? And what they're getting praised for is being completely fresh, pushing envelopes and having no boundaries. Uh, But in the marketplace, it's the exact opposite. Uh, The kind of creativity I'm looking for is is not some wild idea without constraints. I'll leave that for the theorist on innovation and the artist. Uh, I want people who get excited about proving something can be done when you don't have the resources to do it. in the, the U.S. space program, there's a, a famous story of Apollo 13. That was one of the moon missions. And uh, the astronauts up there had an air filter go bad. And the engineers down on the ground had to figure out how to make an uh, air filter out of the things they had up uh, there in space. And they had to put a, a square and a round piece together, which is theoretically impossible. And the way an artist would go would be to say, well, I could do this if. But uh, organizational creativity says, listen, we have to do it regardless because they're going to die if we don't fix it. And that's where many great innovations come out of because they just find a way to make it work. Something's broken. We're going to fix it or they're going to die. And then it's amazing what we can come up with. This makes so much sense because... You do, and sometimes often as the innovator or that kind of change maker within an organization, we get frustrated and we're like, why don't we just do this? And then you realize I have to play with the cards with which I'm dealt because I can't go looking for new cards. You can't change the organization in order to innovate within it. Absolutely. And and for me as a leader of an organization, that's one of the things that helps set apart the employees who are going to move forward and those who aren't. Because the people are going to move forward are the people who find a way when it's supposedly impossible. And the people who aren't are the ones who sit around and whine and say, well, I could if. Well, if doesn't exist. This is what we have. How are we going to find a way to make it work? Uh, Ironically, to use my uh, background in a church and a pastor of a parish, we had a sanctuary that seated 500 people. And we were having over 3,000 people show up. Uh, and yet I live in California in the States where uh, there are all kinds of restrictions on any sort of building, financial plus legal. And so we just had to find a way at work to make it work or we had to close the doors. Uh, it'd be easy to sit around and say, oh, this will work if, 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 but that's not where we lived. You talk, Larry, as, as well about having the right team. So this leads to this nicely where, you know, you talked about that person who might be a moaner. Or, or you know, or, or the innovator who's just not an action oriented innovation an innovator, and we actually need action oriented innovators within the company. And you talk about you give the great example of you know you're trying to reach the peak of a mountain, and you need to have the right team together, and you, you need to also select the right mountain and the right route to get there. Right, and more often than not, the mountain to go to is selected by one to three people. Those are the innovators, the, the the leaders, and then everybody else. You can assign them into different categories of solving problems or, or finding a way to get there. And by the way, one of the things I've learned that uh, wasn't in the book, but uh, when you're building a team to innovate, it's important to understand the difference between people who have a natural bias to strive for goals and those who have a natural bias to solve problems. Uh, We often in in, uh, organizational circles use a goal language, uh, which does nothing for people who uh, are afraid of goals, but if we switch to problem solving language, they'll jump ahead. As an example, we're gonna climb this mountain, and our goal is on day one, we're gonna get to this altitude, and day two to this altitude, and you have these kind of stretch goals out there. Certain personalities love it. They're going to hit the goal. The ones that are afraid of the goal, you approach them this way. Uh, We need to get here. What are the problems that are going to keep us from getting there? 
See, when you use goal language, they come off as negative uh, because they're always pointing out the problems. When you use problem-solving language, they become positive because th the moment you admit, yeah, it's a real problem, I don't know how we're going to do it, they go, oh, okay, now let me help you solve it. So I like to identify who are the goal setters and who are the problem solvers and make sure I'm using the right language with each group because uh, then they'll both help me towards the innovation, whereas otherwise problem solvers are going to just, you know, poured cold water on every idea. This ties in nicely with the idea of avoiding groupthink, for, ex for example, which we'll get into in a second. But when, when you talk as well about an organization's fear of failure, you talk about some people or some organizations want all the data. And in particular, and I, I empathize hugely with you because, you know, I, I coached um, rugby teams and in a way you were you, you, you felt some way beholden for them to come to training in the first place because it was, it was a volunteer arrangement. They weren't getting paid to come there. And, in a, in a, a, and what organization is most like that in the world? It's a church because everybody's a volunteer. So how do you rally the troops and how do you make them innovate or how do you lead them to innovate when there's no incentive or there's no burning platform to do so? I, I think one of the key things for us to understand is not everybody's called to be a leader and not everybody's called to be an innovator. Uh, one of the things that causes uh, leaders to get frustrated is they look on everybody else and say, why don't you act like me? Sometimes I'm working with business owners and they'll say, oh, I'm so frustrated. My employees, they just don't think like an owner. And I go, well, they're not an owner. <laughs> <laughs> they don't get your paycheck or your participation in the profits. Uh, and and I find that sometimes leaders need to understand that what you're looking for is the other leaders in your organization and the other innovators, and it's okay that everybody else is a follower. And then you frame what you're doing around getting the yes votes to get it started instead of getting everybody all amped up and ready to charge the hill. So I don't get frustrated with the non-leaders, the slow adopters. I just figure out how can I get around them uh, and get this thing off the ground enough that they'll go, wow, that's really good. And then they jump aboard late. That's fine. Late's better than never. The benefit of this book years ago for me would have been massive. And one of the ones you talk about is finding a respected champion and how people will listen to that champion and how you even seek out those champions within an organization. In most organizations, that will be the pretty small kind of startup or larger, uh, you can ask this question. Who can single-handedly kill an idea or who can single-handedly make it fly? And in almost every situation where I've asked that, they've known who that person is. And so if i got somebody who can single-handedly uh, kill an idea, then I'll usually try to figure out how do I work with them first to get them on board. I don't need buy-in from everybody, but I do need buy-in from the one who uh, can kill the idea with just a, a, a no or a, a you know, sabotage it with uh, passive aggressive resistance. And sometimes their resistance is not so much the idea, but the way it's being presented. Or uh, their resistance is to just a small part, or maybe they don't understand it. Uh, so that becomes a one on one conversation. And candidly, as I work with boards and as I work with organizations, uh, I've identified those people and they need special attention because um, they have the ability to kill it. Uh, but on the flip side, there's often somebody that single-handedly, if they go, yeah, let's go, everybody else will go, okay, I call them the respected champion. And I, I tell most leaders, unless you've been somewhere so long that you are the respected champion, you need to find out who that person is and uh, get them on your side because they're like a booster rocket. They can cause things to go much, much better. Yeah, and, you, and you, you talk about your own experience here as well, because when you came in as pastor in your church, you were very innovative and you were very excited about pushing some new innovations, but you had a mentor locally who championed you. Absolutely. There was a guy named Wally Norling, and uh, all he had to do one time where I was running into a wall as a, as a young leader and getting some resistance from some older people in, in board structures um, Wally came one day and uh, listened to them, listened to me, and all Wally did was say, you guys need to listen to Larry. He's right. Boom. 50, 80, 
maybe 70, 80 rather percent of the resistance just disappeared. And I could have given the best answers ever, but what I really needed Wally to be was my icebreaker. And now that I've been in an organization a long time, I need to realize my job often is to be an icebreaker, uh, to be that person that says, no, we need to try this. Because as I said, every organization has the people who uh, can kill an idea or can ignite an idea. And it's naive to uh, neglect them. How does one seek them out? So, for example, you didn't have a Wally within an organization and you're looking for that champion to help you. How, how do you go about that? What are the characteristics you're looking for? Yeah, when, when I've tried to help people find it, I just ask this very simple question. Uh, who when it, it, uh, simply says, yeah, let's go that way, uh, has enough uh, clout that everybody will go, okay, I'll give it a try. And, and I've never seen a small group, a nonprofit group, a business group. There's always somebody that everybody realizes fits that. And then what I want to do is I want to meet with them in social settings, not business settings, to uh, share my ideas. Because if I share my ideas in a business setting, uh, they're going to think this is either a go or no-go meeting, and they're going to be much more resistant. If I can share it in a social setting, uh, then what I'm going to hear back is the areas of resistance without them being afraid we're moving forward on some area. So I always use social settings to float a new idea, never formal settings. That's huge advice, that one, because, again, young innovators or entrepreneurs within organizations may not receive this. Nobody receives this coaching, you see, and, they, and they, they're usually picked because of their characteristics but they don't have a framework. And that's what I love about this book. It gives you a framework. Hold, holding in mind that person who can kill or ignite an idea. Let's talk about groupthink because you talk about this where oftentimes a board, for example, so there's a board meeting and there may be no specific agenda or there may be something on the agenda and it's raised. And there can be that person who may be the hippo, the highest paid person in the room, or else they may be the one with the loudest voice who can totally dictate which way the, the vote goes on an idea. Right. And most groups will back down when there is somebody that's uh, negative an idea because we have a desire for harmony. Uh, one of the little principles that I use is that any group of seven or more uh, will always pick harmony over the right decision. Uh, they will table ideas, whatever it would be. But again, that's where, back to what we talked about earlier, becomes so important because uh, when you get one naysayer and, and that feels strongly, the group begins to back off. But you usually can win the naysayer over when you ask for a chance to try something rather than change something. There are very few naysayers who will resist a trial that they know has an exit strategy. Uh, but there's a ton of naysayers who will resist change because people, uh, you know, the problem with groupthink is is people interpret change based on on what they've already known or experienced, not what you're describing for the future. Uh, they 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 can't imagine what doesn't exist, so their their uh, negative vote is based on uh, what they've already experienced and has nothing to do with what you're proposing. That's another really important one for innovation because often it's a curse to be an expert because we get so good at something that we get so focused on it that we don't see the changing patterns on the outside. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, um, it's well known that when it comes to innovation, it's often done by outsiders who aren't restricted by our paradigm and, and, uh, all of our traditions, you know, the first electric cars were not made by car companies because they, they could only think in terms of a combustion engine. Uh, in one of my books, I tell the story of General Mills, a large food company here in the States. And uh, they were trying to turn a factory over, and it took them four and a half hours to switch from making one thing to making the other. And then they went down to a race uh, car. We call them NASCAR. Uh, uh, and uh, they watched a pit crew that changes tires and everything within seconds. Uh, and what they were good at was not food safety. They knew nothing about engineering. They knew nothing about what General Mills did, but they knew one thing, how to do a repetitive task over and over again incredibly quickly. And uh, the executives went down and watched a pit crew. You can imagine the uh, resistance. What are these people going to teach us about a food company? 
And they came back and what used to take four and a half hours now takes 13 minutes. So outsiders often know the secrets uh, and we've got to get out with them because all of our knowledge locks us in a box. There's the other thing is where the curse of being successful, because we, we, we base ourselves on past successes, we base ourselves on adulation, and we start then surrounding ourselves with yes men and women. Yeah, what happens is the more successful you become, the more people think you've always got the right answer. So success can kill us in, in two areas. Uh, uh, one, it can cause us to think we're, we, we're not going to fail, that we're always the smartest person in the room. And then the other thing it can do is cause those who realize, hey, this isn't going to work to be quiet because of the long history of successful uh, decisions. That's why one of the reasons why I like to surround myself with smaller groups where the introverted people will speak up and tell me, hey, that's a really bad idea. Again, I don't want groupthink to come up with the innovation, but I do want groupthink to help me see the subtle flaws in it so I can make all the mid-course corrections uh, that are needed. And uh, when you are successful and primarily um, in a monologue situation or only speaking to large groups, no one's going to speak up and say, hey, that's a crazy idea because they've learned to believe that you're always right and there's no one who's always right. You talk about the the innovator in your midst. So there could be actually people there who are there who might challenge you, but they realize there's no point anymore. And that your job as a leader is actually to spot those people and liberate them. And as you call them, they're eagle, they're potential eagles. And your job is to help them fly. And oftentimes they leave the roost altogether. And the biggest shame is we don't even know sometimes as leaders because we'd never given them the opportunity to spread their wings. Yeah, I'm, I'm a big advocate of what I call uh, championing the young eagles and giving them uh, opportunities to fail. And my job is A, to be an icebreaker, to give them the opportunity, and then B, to uh, put a hedge around them so that the failure can't be fatal. Uh, because again, back to the beginning thing we started today, if most innovations fail, the young eagles innovations are going to fail as well. And what tends to happen is you get more and more successful, a little bit older, you see their failures as a sign that they're not very good at this stuff. And you forget all about your failures in the past. So every leader's job is to make sure that the young eagles are protected and they're given a small little cage in which they can experiment. And as they uh, find success, then it's your job to be that icebreaker uh, throughout the organization to say, hey, let's listen to this. Let's try this. And, and then we're able to keep them time after time. They have to go fly somewhere else because there's no room to fly in our cage. It's such a shame, isn't it, to lose those people because then you lose one of your biggest jobs as a leader, which is to leave a legacy and leave a succession plan. Well, what I find, if you think of the Russian nesting dolls, I find uh, a, 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 if you were to grab any one of them by themselves, the thin wood they're made of, you can crush it. And so what I find a lot of leaders do is they get smaller dolls. So they're, they get the smaller one under them and under them and under them. And what it does, it makes them stronger. You can no longer crush them, but it doesn't grow their or organization. Uh, the way you grow the organization is you get bigger Russian nesting dolls. And uh, they might swallow you up, but they also become just as strong and it grows the organization. I'm amazed how many people search for helpers instead of leaders. That's a brilliant analogy, man. I love that. And, and I actually, I can envision you putting them side by side rather than one inside each other. So it does, it, the organization is lateral and not hierarchical. But the strength comes when we find people who are better than us and we free them up to do what they do better than us. And you go from the beginning of an organization, what you are is you're, you're the head of it. Uh, and then later on, you're the foundation of it. Brilliant, man. I love that. I love that. And we talked briefly about hitting the wall. So leaders will inevitably hit the wall. And you talk about these three reasons that happens and how to recognize them and what to do about them. Uh, what can happen is uh, we can hit the ceiling of our leadership skills. And uh, every one of us does have a leadership capacity. That's all the higher we can raise. But most of us hit a ceiling before we've hit our true ceiling. Uh, that's why a professional golfer has a golf coach, <laughs> you know, look at, like, why do you have a golf coach? You're a pro. Well, all of us hit a wall that somebody else can help us move beyond. 
Um, and that will be one of the, the the walls we hit is just simply our leadership skills. And we need more coaching uh, to uh, be able to break through that. But uh, other times uh, what happens is um, the organizational structures we're, we're within can cause us to hit a wall or a ceiling. And the only way you can break out of that is to change the structures uh, around you. Uh, I come from, in, in, in my tribe of the kind of church that I lead, they they called it congregationalism, and that meant we had to have a vote on things. Well, you can imagine with uh, 13,000, 12,000, 13,000 people showing on a weekend, there's no way that I can have a congregational meeting without a, renting out the uh, local sports field. And so we had to redefine how that was done. Uh, as an organization gets uh, larger, it, it may maybe has little... Uh, locations that are different. They're going to have to change their structure of how they do stuff. So there's a personal leadership led, uh, there's a structure, and then sometimes uh, just the culture shifts on us. <laughs> and what worked uh, 10 years ago no longer works today. Um, and so at the, each one of those points, we have to find a way to break through. You give this really important example of that, and it's when there's this sea change in culture. And I love this one because this hadn't dawned on me. And when you said it, it was like so obvious. There was a time and a place where the number one thing that drew an audience, whether you were a nonprofit or you were a church or you were selling something, it was all about excellence. And that was the 1980s and the 1990s. Books like In Search of Excellence were, were top sellers. And there are still organizations and nonprofits and churches and all kinds of other things that are thinking, boy, if we will do excellence, everybody will show up. But the problem is the culture shifted. Uh, excellence, conspicuous consumption, uh, the desire to have everything branded is no longer where we live today. Where we live today, it's all about authenticity and compassion. And so people are no longer asking when they come to where I serve, uh, how excellent is everything? They're asking how real and honest is everything? That's a totally different question. And if I'm not willing to adapt to that, uh, I'm going to be stuck in the past. And it's so true, and it goes beyond religion. It goes to organizations. It goes to even content creation, where you know people don't believe things anymore because they've been duped in the past. Yeah, and what excellence now uh, no longer says, boy, this is excellent. It says it's phony. That's what people think of. People spend millions of dollars now to make a commercial look like it was shot with a camcorder in a garage. <laughs> we call it after effects. That's how much the... <laughs> shifted away from excellence. Uh, but again, if we don't realize that, we can be chasing the values of the past because they work for us uh, when they're no longer the values of the present and much less the values of the future. Brilliant. And and to, to finish on this one, Larry, so you talk about the importance for innovation, and this one is so often overlooked, the importance of both vision and mission. It'd be great to touch on those, but also f- to get your definition of the difference between them. Well, the difference between uh, mission and vision is is pretty simple. Mission is what we're aiming at. It is it is the absolute bullseye. Vision is a description of what life will look like when we get there. Uh, so, for me, uh, part of my mission is is helping people know God. Well, that's great, but how do you know you got there? You know, vision is a description. Well, they've come to know God when he is involved in their lives. They come to know God when they're involved in community with other people that are pursuing God. They've come to know him when their morality lines up with his. Uh, Those would be examples of what my vision is. Uh, And and you need to have both. You need to have the, the kind of bullseye you're aiming at, but then you need to have a description of what in the world things look like uh, when you get there. And, and vision changes over time. Uh, because uh, knowing God might look uh, one way today and might have looked a different way 25 years ago and might look different 50 years from now. But the mission is always the same. That is unchangeable. But vision starts out with a description, then life changes it, but you keep moving towards it. Another way to look at it would be to say the mission is we're going to go to the top of this mountain. And the vision is what it looks like as we go to the mountain and when we get there. So then, Larry, the leader's job is to sustain that vision and make sure that it's understood across the organization. Yes, because vision is very, very fragile. 
So you have to constantly monitor it yourself. You've got to walk around uh, and see that it's actually continuing. And I think it needs to be communicated in very uh, pithy language. Uh, if a vision is too uh, wordy, uh, nobody can remember it, you know, or it's it's full of jargon or full of cliches that roll their eyes. So uh, I, I, I like to have a mission statement and vision uh, put into almost sound bites that you can say over and over and over again. Uh, you know, I think of Google. We're going to organize data to make it uh, all the world's data to make it useful for people, or it's it's something close to that. I'm not in Google, but anybody in Google would know that. Well, that becomes quite clear. Uh, it's not a long, flowery kind of kind of description. So, Larry, you've given an amazing framework for innovation, and you finished the book beautifully and you talk about the job of the leader is leaving a legacy and setting the stage for future leaders from our perspective as the audience and as buyers and readers of your books thank you for leaving a legacy for us it's been a great pleasure talking to you larry osborne senior and teaching pastor at north coast church and author of innovation's dirty little secret why serial innovators succeed where others fail thank you for joining us Thank you. It's good to be with you.